Good morning. I hope you are well. Uh, I'm a, uh, I had a friend on Facebook that preaches this week explain this. Uh, he called it holiday fog. Uh, and uh, us as, I, I, maybe y'all experience this uh, as a preacher uh, during this season. Uh, it's hard to be in routine. And I've been out of town this week. We've been uh, enjoying the, the New Year's on the coast. And uh, we had a great time. But it, it feels different when you get up and preach and you haven't had your normal week. Uh, I'm a person who thrives on changes to my routine. I enjoy it, but I also realize that it impacts me. And when I've had just a normal week, and so I'm, I'm ready for the new year to begin and for there to be some normalcy and to be a regular routine. Uh, anybody familiar with that feeling? Yes. Uh, we enjoy this holiday season, but also... There's something to be said for routine, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. And this is a season, a time in life where new beginnings are happening, aren't they? Uh, many of you probably uh, did what I'm planning on starting tomorrow. I know everybody says that, but I've been planning this for a long time. I'm, I'm starting to uh, get back to some better health tomorrow. I'm going to work on my eating routine, my exercise routine starting tomorrow. Uh, I know that's the famous last words, right? Uh, and tomorrow, I'm going to start it tomorrow too. Uh, but I'm actually going to start it tomorrow so y'all can hold me accountable since you've heard that. Y'all can ask me next week. Uh, but it, it's a time, a season where, where we think about how we can kind of start off on a new foot. We've just come off the holidays. How can how can we make this year better than we made the last year? How can we make this week better than we made the last week? It's, and we like new beginnings. We celebrate new beginnings. You think about how much we celebrate the birth of a child. Why? It's because it's a, it's a new beginning. Not only is it a new beginning of that child uh, and that child's life into the world, uh, but in all reality, that child, it'll be a, a year or two before they really even know what's going on. You know, I, I make the joke, like, newborn babies are the most boring thing in the whole wide world. Now, I know they're cute and cuddly and all, but they're boring. They don't do anything. You know, the first three or four months of my kids' lives, I was, like, poking them, like, do something. You know, like, uh, they don't do anything. The, the new beginning is for the parents and the family, and everything restarts, and everything's new, and it changes everything. And, and that's what we're really uh, beginning to think about this morning as we... We are kind of continuing, but we're kind of starting new in our Holy Spirit series because we're starting, uh, I mean, you could really almost call this a new series because we're starting into the, the new era, uh, the beginning of the church and the beginning of the reign of the Spirit. And that's what we're going to begin talking about this morning. I want to just kind of start out with this foot. I, I want to kind of start with this. Uh, I'm not going to say anything that will probably be really controversial today. Uh, but as we go through this series, uh, we have a hundred and uh, with the kids out, maybe a hundred and ten or twenty in here this morning. Uh, we probably have about a hundred and ten or twenty different opinions and thoughts about the Holy Spirit and what He does today. Uh, we're we're not all going to get on the same page on every one of these things. There's going to be several times I'm going to present some ideas, and I'm not going to tell you what I believe, and that's okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you the options uh, because I believe that it's possible for us to land in some different places on some of these things. But I do ask for your grace. And I do ask that if you don't agree with me uh, on some things, uh, come to me. Let's talk through them and uh, we can still be brothers and sisters even though we may disagree about some things. Amen? And I, I hope that that will be the spirit in which you receive what it is that we're teaching through in the coming weeks to come. Also, as a note, I started this series mentioning this, but I really want to reiterate it now. If you've got questions that you want answered, my, my hope is that kind of at the very, last, the very last of this lesson, to have accumulated some questions that you might have about the Holy Spirit and spend just some time doing some question and answer. And, um, and in that, we'll probably get some different options, some, just some practical things. And I know that's typically what the questions are. They're practical things. How does the Holy Spirit work today? How do signs and tongues and prophecies, these things that we see that are work that are, are gifts of the Spirit given in the New Testament, how are they working or not working in our world today? And um, you may have a lot of questions about that. Write them down, scribble them down. You can just hand them to me. You can text me. You can email me. My email is in the uh, directory if you if you need reference to that. If you want to grab my phone number, um, and we'll make a collection of those. And if we don't answer them, 
in the lessons. At the very end, we'll kind of have a question and answer session in regard to this. So we're in Acts 2 today. Uh, Acts 2 is a, a famous passage, maybe the most famous passage. If you were raised in uh, the Church of Christ, you've heard Acts 2 specifically get down really this whole passage and you've heard me preach on it several times and we're just going to spend some time in it today and we're going to try to go through this and uh, realize that as we go through this we're going to kind of try to focus in on the spirit but also some of the peripheral things things that are not necessarily directly related to the spirit we're going to hit on because they're going to become important as we go through the rest of the series so we're going to begin verse one we're going to read through we're not going to read through all this it's a little too long to read all of it but we're going to read in parts and we're going to look at the new beginnings that happen, uh, the, the, thing, the change that's happening in Acts chapter 2. Let's begin verse 1. When the day of Pentecost has come. Now, Pentecost uh, is the, a day, the word penta meaning 50. It's 50 days after Passover. Uh, the, if you look in the Old Testament, you'll see it's seven sevens, right? So seven times seven is what? 49, but the way it would have been counted is they would have counted that first day, so you would have technically eight Sundays, but you had seven sets of seven between, and so it's 50, and it, is, it was a day that differentiated, they had two harvest feasts, and Leviticus tells all about this, about how this feast, this, uh, and they were going to be offering uh, the, the first fruits of the harvest, this is the time between the wheat harvest and the barley harvest. And they're going to be offering these first fruits. It's a celebration that God brings new life each year to the, to the harvest, a new harvest each year. And it was a celebration of that that's taking place. And it would have been one of the feast festivals where all a large portion, especially the males in the Jewish population, would have been traveling into Jerusalem to celebrate this festival together. So they come 50 days after Passover Sunday. So we're talking about 50 days after Jesus has risen from the dead and they come together. And they were all together in one place. Now, who were the all? Who were they? Uh, there's a, a com most common belief, if you look back into chapter 1, uh, you'll see that there, were, uh, there was a group of a around 120 that were gathered together. I tend to take that, that that's who, who's mentioned here. So they're all together in one place. Let's say it's the 120. And suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house. They were sitting. Now, we started this series talking about wind and breath and that Hebrew word, the ruach of God, the, the breathing out that the spirit would be the breath, the outflow from God. Uh, the spirit, the word, we haven't covered this, but the word for spirit in the New Testament is pneuma. Uh, it's where we get our word like a pneumatic tool, a pneumatic tool that works on air pressure, right? Pneuma. And that's the, it's, it's the same concept. It's, it's, it's the idea of pressurized air, air under pressure, but we also think of a pneumatic tool, and you think it's a very powerful tool. So we, we get that's where we get our word pneumatic. Uh, it's the, the concept of wind. And we see that God is going to pour out his spirit here, and he does so with a violent wind. And I don't think that's by accident. It's very in keeping with the way we have seen. And remember when you see the word ruach in the Old Testament, sometimes it meant the Spirit of God, the person that is the Holy Spirit, but sometimes it just meant wind. And so this wind comes from heaven. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Now fire is, a, fire is also another word, uh, another clue, context clue here, that this is a, an act of God. He uses fire regularly to represent himself. Even you go back into Moses in the, the burning bush story, right? The concept of fire. And fire is all, all throughout the Old Testament. You'll see the concept of fire. So you see wind and you see fire come into the play here. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now tongues is a, is a controversial thing in, in our world today. Uh, we're going to get there as we go through this series. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, we see a couple different kinds of tongues in Scripture, though. One, set, one type of tongue that we see is this, right? That they're speaking different languages um, to each other. And this is as the Spirit's enabling them to do. And now, verse 5, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews, 
from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because, bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. So crowd begins to us because they, they don't communicate with each other well. They're, they're all gathered together and they speak different languages. And some of those dialects may have interlapped a little bit. So, you know, it's kind of like if you can speak Spanish, there's sometimes when you'll say a word over here and you're like, that's very similar to the English word. And sometimes it's very different from the English word. And so sometimes our languages would overlap. But for the most part, we struggle, we even in this audience do, we have two very different languages spoken. And so we have to have that translated so we understand. And the same thing was happening here, right? You've got one person, you've got people speaking, but they're all hearing it in their own native tongue. Now, what is this supposed to invoke? What's this supposed to hit for us? What's it supposed to to stay, to begin to make us think about. Well, it should make us to go back to where this all started. Where did different languages start? Not a trick question, you know it. All right, the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel is a story we probably don't talk a lot about, enough about, because it, it has huge implications for how the world works and everything involved in the grand story of Scripture. So at the Tower of Babel, the people were of one mind. The Bible says that that they were going to be able to do whatever they put their mind to. That they were trying to build this tower. They're trying to congregate. And the, now God's plan was for them to what? Spread. And so that was what God wanted them to do is spread out. And they decided we're going to congregate. And we're going to make a name for ourselves. That was what they were planning on doing. But we see here this concept of what's beginning to happen again. Where the world had spread, the world is kind of beginning at this point. There's this grand reversal that's happening. Go ahead and go to the next slide here. Uh, Pentecost begins, it does not complete, but it begins a grand reversal of Babel. We're heading towards a world in which we can all communicate and talk with each other clearly. Right? The end of this... There, there's going to be, when we're with God, there's not going to be communication barriers that we still experience. And, and what I think is cool is we see that, that even in this scenario, we begin to see this, and we're working towards this. Uh, even in our world today, you notice how this has gotten better? We have technologies and things that we're able to communicate with people that we've never been able to communicate with before. It's kind of cool because we talk about, you know, we're part of the reconciliation of all things, the bringing back of all things, and we take part of that in our story, and we see the world beginning to do some of these things. And so we see the world has begun this process of bringing back where we have this, or where tongues, being able to speak in different tongues, isn't the huge hurdle that it used to be. It's still a hurdle. We're not there yet. But Pentecost was not supposed to be the moment. Some people, and, and I... I went back and corrected this because I think when I, I put the, uh, that it, it is a grand reversal of Babel, it's not a grand reversal. It begins a grand reversal of the Tower of Babel and what happens there. Right? We're working back towards the world, and the Spirit is working back, reconciling, and bringing all things back together. And that begins at Pentecost. It begins ultimately through the work of the church. The ultimate work of the church is that we will ultimately all come back and we'll have one language. And we'll all be together under the kingship of Jesus. And so Pentecost begins this grand reversal. And it was supposed to immediately evoke in our thoughts. Uh, it, this would have been, they would have seen, oh, this is the exact opposite of what happened at Babel. Babel, they were trying to make a name for themselves. And God separated them and spread them out. And they knew the languages and they separated. And now we come back and the Spirit is coming. And now we can all hear in our own tongue. And so that's exactly what happens, and it's, it's a work of the Spirit, and it's a clear work of the Spirit. What's interesting is, we're going to see as we go through this, that some people would ultimately reject this concept. They would start accusing the apostles of being drunk. This is not something that could happen for a drunk person, right? Uh, this is not, it, it makes no sense. And it goes to show us what? People will believe what they want to believe. And ultimately, even in the day of Pentecost, when this great work's happening, and they understand everybody's hearing their own language, and their answer is, well, they must be drunk. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but, but people will form, and they'll, if they have an idea sometimes of what they believe is a set norm, they won't allow anybody to deviate, let, that, let them deviate from it. 
And so they were believing what they wanted to believe. But this was a grand reversal, and it was an a outpouring, a major miracle of God, what's happening in this moment. And it should be recognized as such. Uh, let's continue on reading. Peter begins to address the crowd, and in verse 14, he begins this addressing of the crowd and what happens. And he's talking about the prophet Joel and what the prophet Joel says. He, he's linking what is happening in this very moment to the prophecies that said it would happen. The prophecy said that the Holy Spirit was going to have this outpouring. And, and he's beginning to show the links to the puzzle. And he's doing it, uh, he's going to link in, in several ways. But let's read verse, uh, beginning verse 16. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the, this is really important for us, okay? Got your Bible, underline it. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. That's important too. Before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So uh, go back slide before this. Let's see what we see in verse, verse 16 or verse 17. In the last days. Now go to the next slide. Verse When we go into verse 20. 20 before the coming of the great. And glorious day of the Lord. What happens at Pentecost is a new era. A new era that starts that is called the last days. Anytime you see in scripture something called the last days. That means the time you're living in right now. You're living in the last days. Uh, interestingly enough the apostles were living in the last days. And it's just a, a concept. And it's really important for us to understand this. is a concept of the era that would start at Pentecost. In the outpouring of the Spirit. And it would end ultimately on the day in which the Lord would come again. On the, the day, the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. The day in which Jesus' second coming would come. So anytime you see something about the last days, you're talking about the era that would begin at Pentecost and goes to this day and will go until the day that Jesus comes again. And so, uh, go ahead and go to our next slide here. Pentecost begins the last days. Pentecost begins a, a new day, and those days would be called the last days. Now, we understand there's ultimately one more dispensation, as we would call it, to come. All right, there's, there's the day in which uh, Jesus returns and, and does what he's going to do in that day, and ultimately the reconciliation that happens in that day of all things. Uh, it's, it's a powerful thing, and ultimately that's going to be the work of God. And the work of God alone. But what happens during these days is going to be a partnering. A partnering that takes place between God and his people. And it was pri the primary vehicle that would operate those last days. That The way God would work in those last days was going to be through the Spirit. And the Spirit ultimately living in, dwelling in people. And ultimately the formation of what we would call the church. Now... Sometimes we, want to, we say this, and I have said this before, and it's probably technically not wrong, but we sometimes say Pentecost was the start of the church. And we kind of think about what that concept means, and we sometimes have a very institutionalized idea of what the church is. But the church is simply the concept of those who are called out for Jesus and the concept of Jesus and uh, being people of Jesus, a collective group of people. We weren't the first church. In other words, the church existed actually existed before Pentecost. But what we see beginning at Pentecost is the last days of the church. That Jesus' people now would be congregated in this very unique way. And we would be united and we would find our unity how? We would find our unity in the Spirit. And that's what we're going to see as we go through uh, this, set of, this set of scriptures. So if you were to read down, we're not going to take time to read it all. We're going to skip a little bit here. But Peter begins uh, pointing out to the Israelites that who Jesus was, that Jesus was raised from the dead, and that, that the one who you was raised from the dead, he was going to, uh, verse 24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep hold of him. 
And then he links them to David. He does it a couple of times. One begin in verse 25, but again, happening uh, down verse 30. Uh, verse 25, he tells a prophecy from David. Come down to verse 30, but he, he being David, was a prophet. He knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. So Jesus was ultimately going to become, a, he became a man, but the man would become king. Seeing what was to come, verse 31, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he was received from the Father. He, he has received, notice this, verse 33, from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. We have at least one time in Scripture where the Spirit is called the Spirit of Jesus. It's something I may have missed most of my life, I think I missed this, this concept here, that the Spirit was given on Pentecost by Jesus himself. That's so what Jesus promises. What does Jesus promise? He says, I'm going to go, we noticed this uh, a few weeks ago, I'm going to go and I'm going to send someone else, send a helper, a name. So what happens here is, as Jesus is exalted, he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. He, he gains the, the ability to send the Holy Spirit, and Jesus sends it, and he pours out on his people. So what happens here at Pentecost is the beginning of the pouring out of the Spirit. It begins the reign of the Spirit. The new era would be an era that was marked the difference in the era that we had seen, where we saw the Spirit working. We looked through the Old Testament, we saw a lot of the work of the Spirit, but we saw the work of the Spirit as an, an external force, right? It was, it was a thing that took place. Uh, it, would, it would come and go from people. It would hit and miss, and it would work in certain ways as an outflowing of God. But ultimately, this reign of the Spirit, God was going to send. And this was the promise of Jesus that, would, that what they had seen living among them would now live in them. And so when Jesus sends the Spirit, Jesus sends the Spirit, he sends it into the hearts of man in a powerful way, and that begins right here in the Pentecost story. Uh, so it continues, and this is where Jesus, uh, where Peter convicts them that they were the ones that had, had taken the Son of God and that they had put him on the cross. They were guilty, they had blood on their hands. The same blood you and I have on our hands when we sin, when we have are lost without Jesus. The sin that nailed him to the cross. The people heard this. They were cut to their heart and they said to Peter and all the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What do we need to do about the blood that's on our hands? We've seen this powerful, the Spirit, you, you said this new era has begun. Something new and different has begun. So what is it that we need to do in this new era? Now, we, we do this. This is really easy for us and common for us. Any of you that have ever become, well, I, I started out with this analogy, I'll continue it. If you've ever become a parent, or even become a grand, or as you become a grandparent, you ask the question, all right, what's changed? What are the, the new things I have to do now because I'm a parent. Well, life changed, didn't it? Everything changed because this new being has come in and now everything changes as a result of it. And as grandparents, you have that same question. All right, what's my new role? What, is, what will be my, res, my responsibilities? Uh, not, and maybe not responsibilities, but what will be my privileges? You know, how am I going to help? How am I not going to help? I'm going to give space to the family, but how am I also going to be involved with the family? You ask all those questions. It's the same question they ultimately ask. All right, Spirit has come. He's shown this is a moment from God. You've convicted us that this Jesus that we crucified, we nailed to the cross. Many of the people in that crowd may have very well been present. They may have very well been the people that were screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And here they are, and they're saying, all right, you have convicted us that these prophecies, the prophecies of Joel, the prophecies of David, all point to the man Jesus, that Jesus died, he was raised from the dead. He dwelt among us. Now, what do we need to do? And it's the same question I would ask. It's the same question you should ask. 
It's the question of now that we live in the era of the Spirit, what shall we do? And Peter replies to them very simply. He says, you need to repent and be baptized, uh, every one of you, in in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. One comes in, how does one come into contact with the Spirit? The normative way, the way that the Bible teaches that people came into contact with the Spirit is that they were baptized into Jesus Christ and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was the, that's the simplest. You, you want to have the Spirit living in you, then that's my simple plea to you that, that you would be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. We can overcomplicate it, but there's no need to overcomplicate it. We can. We can get into all the things and, and well, my, somebody teaches this different, that different. You know, that's one of the things is, that's out of my control, right? What God will do uh, with those that do differently than that, that's out of my league. What I can teach you and what I can tell you is, I would encourage you to do what was normative, all right? I know, because it's very clearly in Scripture, that if you will be baptized for the forgiveness, repent, change your life, make a turn in your life, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, that the Holy Spirit will be in you. And I can know that because Scripture very clearly teaches it. And so therefore, I think it's our duty to be clear that the only way I can ensure that the Holy Spirit lives in you is if you repent and are baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then the Holy Spirit will come and live in you. And you say, well, is that for me? Or was that just for the people in Acts chapter 2? Let's go to the next verse, verse 39. The promise is for you. All right, that's not you. That's the people that were there. The promise is for your children and all who are far off. That would be a reference to the Gentiles at the time. Now, I had some people, some well-meaning people in my life who tried to just kind of stop it there and say, well, this promise of the Holy Spirit, the promise that the Holy Spirit would live in you, it was for, for them, it was for their children, and then it was for the, the Gentiles that were far off. But then the Bible would get formed, right? By the time, it was just like for them and their children. Not their children's children, just their children. Like, that was very definitive. Uh, and then for some reason, I was like, man, that kind of makes sense. And I, don't th- I think I quit reading too, but very, <laughs> we need to see this. For all whom the Lord our God will call. The promise of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit was a promise not only for them, it's a promise for anyone who would live in the last days. It's a promise for me, it's a promise for you that the Spirit would live in you and the Spirit living in you. And what all does that mean? Well, it means a whole lot. And that's what we're going to start exploring in the weeks to come, in the days to come. So ultimately what we see is that this is the beginning of, This period is the beginning of the outpouring of the Spirit. This is the promised outpouring. That the Spirit would be poured out on the people. Not sprinkled down on the people. Not drizzled out a little bit here and there. No, the Spirit, when it comes, it was going to pour out on people. It was going to be a groundswell. It was going to be a changing event. An event that ultimately changes everything. It begins these new days. We come into contact with that Spirit. We come into contact with the outpouring of that Spirit through the, our baptism into Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And I would encourage you, if you've never done that, that, that today would be a great day to make that. You don't have to know a whole lot. You, you need to know that Jesus is. He was and is and He is to come. You need to know you're living in these last days. And in these last days, you're called to simply allow, you know, some people say what we do and what we teach with baptism, that we're teaching a works-based salvation. That we're teaching that, that we are somehow earning God. And, and I would encourage you to understand that what happens in the waters of baptism is not you doing anything. It's allowing God to do something to you. You're, you're not the actor. okay? You're the object. The actor is God. God's the one doing the work. And I would encourage you, if you've never put on Christ in baptism, today could be the day of your salvation. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for, for the, the start of this new era, the new days. We're thankful that we live in those days. We're thankful that you have been patient with us to this point. And we just pray that if there's any heart in this audience who doesn't have that gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, 
that they would repent, they would make a change in their life, and they would wash away their sins today. And we know, Lord, that as they hollow themselves and allow, allow you to begin to work in them, your Holy Spirit will come into their life and they'll never be the same. God, we thank you for that promise. We live and we relish and we, we work within that promise and we thank you and we praise you as our God. And the church together says, Amen. If you've never become a Christian, let today be the day. If you need the love of your brothers and sisters, if you have any spiritual need, we would love to assist while we can, while we stand to sing together.